Hello and welcome back to the channel. This is the second in a projected series on astrophotography. In the first installment, we looked at the history of photography and astrophotography, taking us up from the 1840s all the way up to around the late 1990s, and found that over 150 years or so, not a lot had changed. Astrophotography just wasn't a thing. Today we're going to take a look at a question that I sometimes get asked. Why do astrophotography at all? I mean, the sky has already been photographed many times over by people who are likely better than us. Well, it turns out there are a couple of answers to this. You see, astronomy is one of the last hard sciences where the amateur is still making a difference. If you have an interest in geology, for example, you don't get to play with the Hope Diamond every day. If you're interested in marine biology, you don't get to swim with great white sharks. But if you're interested in astronomy, you have access to the same raw material, the same night sky that everybody else does, including professional astronomers. And in fact, the amateur might even have the advantage. Why? Numbers. There are simply more of us out there doing these things. Now, according to some estimates, there are somewhere between five and 6,000 professional astronomers here in the world, depending on how you count them, most of them conducting very specialized research. I don't know about you, but whenever I talk to a professional astronomer, half the time, I don't even understand what they're talking about. But in terms of amateur astronomers, there are anywhere between a quarter of a million and a half a million of us out there doing this. Some of this depends on how you define an amateur astronomer. People like us are just discovering things up there in the night sky simply because there are so many more of us. As an example, locally there is, a, there is a study being conducted called the MDW Sky Survey. The three initials stand for the three people doing this. Two of them are employees of Sky and Telescope magazine. The third person sadly has passed away. They are photographing the entire night sky in H-alpha light. Now, you would assume that this has already been done many times before, but it hasn't. They're doing this locally in their spare time and they say they've already discovered dozens of objects that don't appear in any catalog at all. In July of 2008, Dave Jurasevich in California was out with his astrophysics AP160 telescope and discovered this, the Soap Bubble Nebula. Now, what's interesting about this is the Soap Bubble is right next to the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus, that's NGC 6888. And what I find fascinating is that We've been taking pictures of this, the Crescent Nebula for a hundred years at least, and nobody found this thing. So, you know, whenever this happens, I always check my own images. I've taken images of the Crescent many times. This is the best one that I took through, actually through this, the astrophysics stowaway here. Now, the green arrow is pointed right at where the soap bubble is, and I have magnified that and pixel peeped, and I didn't find it. But if I had, you know what? It, I could have been the guy who found this. They could have named that thing after me. Perhaps one of the most famous amateur discoveries is SL9, Shoemaker-Levy 9, which hit Jupiter back in 1994. Now, amateurs, the Shoemakers, and David Levy were out and discovered this thing that struck Jupiter. And for several days and weeks, you could see this scarring across Jupiter. It was fascinating to watch. Keep in mind, this was done during 1994 technology. This would be much easier and much better and much higher resolution today. Seeing that caused Hollywood to make movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact, if you remember that far back, and has actually started a worldwide movement among governments to search for objects that might hit the Earth. All of this on behalf of amateurs. Another famous one was Comet Hale-Bopp back in 1997. Probably the best comet in my lifetime, but Alan Hale and Thomas Bopp were out in the Arizona desert, which I believe with their 16-inch reflectors and independently found this thing in the constellation of Sagittarius, I believe. It helps to know that area very well because, you know, they saw this thing and they knew it wasn't supposed to be there. I actually have a signed picture of that comet. It's actually being obscured by the Mead number 826 reflector back there, but that's what it looks like. So it turns out these impacts happen a lot more often than people realize. Ethan Chappell found a similar impact on Jupiter 
in his backyard with, I believe, a Celestron C8 in Texas. And in January 2019, we had an eclipse that was visible from here. I was outside photographing that eclipse. Now, the thing I remember about that night is it was really, really cold out. I think the temperature was about minus five degrees. It was so cold, I could barely work the shutter with my finger. And I recall halfway through the eclipse, the camera's battery died and I didn't have a spare for that particular battery. So I had to take it out, run inside, warm it up, run back outside, put it back in, and it would work for a few minutes and I'd have to keep doing that back and forth. But it turns out that if you were taking a picture at just the right moment, you caught this particular impact. Now it only happened for a split second, but it didn't matter because this was one of the most photographed eclipses in recent memory. And if you just happened to be taking a picture at that moment, you caught that little white dot. And of course, when I found out about this, I went through the next day and looked through the hundreds of pictures that I took and no, I didn't catch that one either. Now, if you're interested in more serious research, there are a number of programs you can get involved with. One of them is the observation of variable stars. Again, there just aren't enough professional astronomers out there to do this, so they rely on amateur data to measure the variability of star brightnesses. We have one club member who's really into this. The AAVSO, the official governing body of this, it collects data from all of us, and he has submitted and cataloged over 10,000 variable star observations. You know, whenever amateur astronomers get together, the debate starts. The old masters knew how to make lenses. Computer-designed lenses just can't match what the person's hand could feel and the secrets died when the masters died with them. Old telescopes were better than the new ones. Is this true? Are the legends truly legends, or should the legends have stayed legends? Well, I tried to answer this. What Stradivarius is to the violin, the Clark refractor is to our world. Alvin Clark and his sons made somewhere around 600 of these refractors, and they are pretty much priceless today. There's a book. Alvin Clark and Sons, Artists in Optics, cataloging every one that they could find. And this is also a very good read. This book is maybe out of print, but if you can find it, I would pick this thing up. So it turns out there is a Clark refractor locally. It is a circa 1912, nine inch F12 refractor atop the Harvard Observatory. I have a friend who's a Harvard professor who could get me access to this thing we decided to just run some tests to see what happens. Now, one of Clark's secrets is said to be that he used a thinner glass than most other manufacturers did at the time. The theory is quite simple. The less glass there is, the less junk there is between you and the sky. So we ran some tests, and the first thing we did was we took some images of some buildings in, di in the distance. These are the Prudential Tower and the John Hancock Tower. And as you can see, it's not an apo, it's an acromat. You can see purple halos around bright objects. The star test is outstanding. Inside and outside of focus, I could detect no aberrations whatsoever, other than a little bit of false color. Now, I was warned the problem with the telescope is not apt optical, it is mechanical, and we found that out pretty quickly. For example, the lens cell isn't the best in the world, depending on where you move the telescope from one side of the sky to the other, the optics can shift a little bit. Now, this is one of the most famous telescopes in this area. Stephen James O'Meara very famously determined the orbital period of Uranus within a few percent visually and by the way, I tried that. We looked at Uranus through this thing, and I'm in awe. All I saw was a featureless green-blue blob that was kind of dancing around. Stephen, I have no idea how you did that. So we did run a couple of tests, both on webcam lunar planetary and on deep sky. Let's look at the moon first. Using modern techniques, put the webcam planetary imager in it and looked at several objects and took some of these images. Now, to compare this, there aren't a lot of nine inch F12 refractors out there. So I picked the closest thing that I had on hand for comparison. This is my Mead 10 inch F10 Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And yes, it's a different design, but the aperture and focal length are sort of the same. So at least it's a modern telescope we can compare it to. 
Let's take a look at some of these images. Now on Clavius, take a look at the contrast in the little craterlets inside Clavius and on Plato. Here you can see there is a little bit of difference there. I'm going to leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. And keep in mind, this is not a scientific test. This is just my attempt to take a snapshot in time. Now in deep sky, this got challenging. <laughs> the telescope, I was told, does not track well. And boy, they weren't kidding. <laughs> I had to keep the exposures so short. Of course, back then there were no such things as auto guider ports. And not only that, the telescope was not balanced. So when I put my camera at the end of it, it was now out of balance and we were resorting to moving weights around. And not only that, it's an inch and a quarter only visual back that doesn't have a very good clamp at the end of it. We wound up resorting to duct tape like solutions just to keep the camera on the telescope itself. But I ran a bunch of subframes on the Orion Nebula and looking at this here, that XO pattern you see, the X's are the bad ones. Those are the ones that did not track. The O's are the ones that are tracking. Now close to 30 to 40% of these were no good, even at only a few seconds of exposure. But I just kept taking them just so that I would get enough. We stacked them in Pix Insight, and we were able to get this. And again, it's not bad. I ran the test with two different cameras, my Astro Modified EOS 5D Mark III and my Astro Modified T3i. I figured the T3i might be better because it's lighter, but because it has an APS-C sensor, there's a 1.6x crop factor in it, which magnifies all of your problems so that the number of bad subframes actually got worse. If you don't know what any of that means, this was just plain frustrating. So a few nights later, I ran a test on this. This is my Takahashi FS-102. We'll compare the two images of through the Clark and through a modern apochromatic refractor. So there you have it, a look at why we do astrophotography and a look at a sidebar as to comparing a vintage Clark refractor to something modern. In the next installment, we're going to take a look at the first type of astronomical imaging, which is nightscapes. A nightscape is any astrophotography activity involving, say, a camera mounted on a tracking mount. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.